I want to walk you through all the steps required for designing a race car suspension. Now that we have defined springs, entry bars, and bump stops, we'll design together the damping characteristics that we want in our GT3 car. Hello everyone, this is Bruno. Before we start, let's do a quick recap of what we've done so far in the series. If you remember well, we are creating together a case study, which is a GT3 front suspension design. We started by designing the outer pickup points, inboard pickup points, and all actuation pickup points. Now we are done with kinematics, and we can focus on the next step of the process, which is designing dampers. So for this case study, it is important to know that the values that we are using are only examples. They are not recommendations. Besides that, there are obviously many parameters that we are not taking into account, since this is just an exercise. As you can see, for each step of the process, we documented the whole thing, and you can get access to all of these notebooks in the video description. All right, now that we have the stiffness completed, then we can move on to determining the damping characteristics and damper curves that you would like to have in your race car. So first, we define what is the ride and platform behavior that we expect from our car. Do we want it to have a better ride over curbs, ride over bumps and mechanical grip, or do we expect it to have a really good platform control? From that decision, we can determine the damping ratio that we would like to run in our system, and from that, we can calculate the damper curves. So what are the objectives that we have when defining damping? Well, the first one is to maximize mechanical grip. If we want to optimize grip, we need to reduce the amount of load variation, basically how much the car is jumping over bumps and over curbs. For that, we minimize load variation, and we need to find an appropriate damping to achieve that. The second aspect to consider when defining damping is platform control. So how are we controlling the movement of our suspension in braking or our car in braking, roll, and so on? We could have two goals with this. Number one is to minimize aerodynamics variation so that the aero balance is a little bit more constant, not changing with every driver input or every change of behavior of the car. And the second thing is also to improve driver fuel. Sometimes he needs to fuel a stiffer car that transfer loads faster, that does not move as much, that does not oscillate as much. So these are all the different parameters that we have to consider when defining damping. So we're going to have to find a compromise between them, depending on the type of car that we're working with. Okay, but how do we quantify damping? There are two main metrics that we have to discuss. The first one is critical damping. Critical damping is basically a property of the system. So based on the stiffness of the system and the mass of the system, we can understand what is the critical damping. If we are using this critical damping in our system, we get the curving black. You see that you have no oscillation, you do not have any overshoot, but it, and it also does not take as long to get back to the steady state value after an initial displacement that we can see here. The second and even more important parameter is what is the damping ratio that we want to run. The damping ratio is nothing more than the damping that we're really running on the car, as measured at the wheel, compared to the system critical damping. So if we're running a damping which is a lot higher than the critical damping of the system, this number will be above 1. As we can see here, we have a lot of damping, so it takes a lot of time for the system to go back to its initial position after an initial displacement. Or we can be running a damping at the wheel that is lower than the critical, than the critical damping which we'll see as numbers such as 0, 02, 0, 06, 0, 08. And we can see in blue, for example, when we have very little damping compared to the critical damping, the system oscillates a lot and it takes a lot of time to settle down. While if we use a, a damping ratio of, let's say, 0 0.8 in green, we go back to the steady value very quickly and we do not oscillate as much. So from this experiment, can you see that 0.8 seems like a very good place to be with a race car? It does not take a lot of time to go back to the initial position. Actually, it's even better than a critical damping of 1. It's faster, you go back faster to your initial position. And you do not overshoot, you are, or you have very small overshoot. So if, for example, if you look at the integral of each of these curves, a damping ratio of about 0.7 or 0.8 will minimize that. All right, so this gives you an intuitive appreciation for why a, a damping ratio of about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 could be good for a race car. 
since in this case we're minimizing the oscillation of the car or the load variation on the tires. In summary, 0.2 damping ratio, you have too much oscillation. If you go higher, one, you have no overshoot, but it takes a little longer for you to settle, while 0.7, 0.8 seems to be a good compromise. So what happened? Whenever I heard this very theoretical explanations from different vehicle dynamics book, I never believed in them. I need a proof, a real proof, not only an intuitive example. So when you go and you do post-rig simulations or post-rig testing, then you get convinced that indeed, for many if not most race cars, a good starting point would be between 0.7 and 0.8 damping ratio. Why? Because in this range, you seem to find the ideal compromise between our two objectives. You are trying to minimize load variation at the same time as minimize platform control. Because of these reasons, for this initial design, before we run post-rig simulations, I will target a damping ratio of 0.8 for the baseline setup. For the adjustments, so when we go softest or stiffest on the damping, I'm gonna also try to achieve a range between 0.5 and 1.2 damping ratio, because then this, I make sure that the engineers running this car can have a really wide range of possibilities for depending conditions, temperature, tracks, curbs, driver characteristics. I want them to have enough freedom. And then lastly, for this first iteration, I will assume that the bump and rebound behavior will be symmetrical. So I'm just saying that I want the same damping ratio in bump and rebound, we can change that later. All of this, we are focused on the low speed characteristics of the damping. So if we look at the damper curve, we have the low speed region, then we have the knee point, and then we have the high speed region. Typically, we could try to design the low speed to include all of the speeds when the car is rolling, pitching, going up and down slowly, and for high speed, it could be when the, the suspension is oscillating over bumps and over curbs. So for this design, we are going to define, after looking at, for example, data from a previous generation, I will say that the knee point that I want for this damper um, is around 50 millimeters per second over here, while I would like a scaling factor of 0.3 of damping for high speed. So if I have a given inclination, which is the damping coefficient, for low speed, I can define what is the scaling factor that I want for high speed. In this case, I'm using 0.3. These are arbitrary numbers and with experience and working with these cards, you can understand what is a good place to start with. Now that we understand the theory behind defining the damping ratio that we want for our system, let's dive into the calculations themselves. So first we define ride and platform behavior. We've discussed that. The next step is to calculate the critical damping at the wheel then we need to define a target damping ratio. If we know the critical damping and the ratio of this critical damping we would like to have, we can calculate the damping directly at the wheel. Now we are again at the, syst uh, at the system level and we need to convert from system level to component level, which would be the damper. How do we do that? Again, we will use motion ratio and then we can end up with the damper curves that we need to send to our damper designer. So for these calculations, even though we have suspended mass, springs, and then tire carcass, and then tire stiffness, in order to use the simple equations I want to use in this exercise, we have to disregard the tires. So all of the frequencies and damping ratios we are discussing are only on the suspension. If you want to go a little bit more complicated and include tires, then you cannot use linear equations. You would need to, for example, run post-rig simulations. You can do that as a next step. So first we calculate critical damping. I already gave you the equation, we just apply the stiffness and mass of the system in order to come up with this number. So we have a critical damping ratio of 13 newton second per millimeter. Let's now calculate the real damping that we want at the wheel. Well, we know that the damping ratio we want is 0.8, and we know that the damping ratio we will also define what is the real damping we have on the wheel. We just follow this equation, we manipulate it a little bit, and if we want to use 0.8 of the critical damping, which is 13, we come up with a damping coefficient at the wheel of 10 newton second per millimeter. This is at the system level. In order to, con to convert from system level to, to component level, we have to use the motion ratio. So the equation is very similar as we've used for springs. So by manipulating this equation over here, we can convert from damping at the wheel, at the system, to the damping at the damper, and we come up with a number of 18. Why do we do that? Why do we calculate first on the system level before going to the component level? 
Well, because for vehicle dynamics, what matters is what the car is seeing. It is what the dynamics of the car is seeing. This is why we look at system levels. This is why we see it as measured at the wheels and not as the component. But in order to design the component, we need to know the curve of the component. And here we have it. We have 18 Newton second per millimeter. A few other analysis that could be done after this in terms of damping would be to calculate damping ratio also in row and pitch for you to understand where you are and compare different adjustments. You could calculate the transient lateral load transfer distribution or the row stiffness distribution in, tra in transient with the damper. So when you're cornering, now the dampers are also influencing your load transfer. The dampers are influencing the car balance. So you can run that metric as well. Next, you could perform post rig simulations because with simulations, you can start connecting rear damping versus front damping at the same time. You can start looking at both axles at the same time and you can find best compromises. So even though your initial number was 0.8, when you run post-rig simulations, you can see that maybe a combination of 0.9 on the front and 0.6 on the rear will minimize different metrics such as load variation, such as ride height variation, and so on. This is why this type of simulation is so powerful. And lastly, either using post-rig simulation or post-rig testing or testing the car at the track, you can play with different bump and rebound bias. This means that you could have a different damping ratio in bump rebound and this will affect the dynamic of the vehicle. Now that we are done with the theoretical calculations and manual equations, I can show you another tool that I use. So for example, in this tool, I can set all of the vehicle parameters. I can also define what motion ratios I have, what wheel rates I have, and what is the damping ratio that I want. Remember 0.8 and a scaling factor of 0.3 for the high speed and a knee point of 50 millimeters. And let's say that I want a range of adjustment between 0.5 damping ratio to 1.2 damping ratio. This tool will calculate for me what is the final damper curve that I need. So it gives me the low speed and high speed behavior. So I can try to find a damper that matches this. Or even better, I can understand with all of the different adjustments. So the softest adjustment, the stiffest adjustment, what is the range that I could expect. So I'm trying to find the damper that I want or giving this curve to a damping, uh, damper manufacturer, they can tell me which damper gives also this range of adjustment. So in this video, we saw how to go from really high level design targets in terms of damping to designing the specific damping curves. So we defined how to determine the damping ratio or damping ratio adjustment that we would like to have in order to minimize load variation and maximize platform control. Next, you should apply all of this theory, build your race car and go test it. Go test it in labs and tracks in order to fine tune all of this first version that we created together. Please remember that you can have access to all of these notebooks describing in details each part of the process by going to the link in the video description. If you like this content, you would love our seminars. We offer an applied vehicle dynamics seminar where you get a lot more information in each of the steps of the process of designing the stiffness, damping, kinematics, aerodynamics of your race car, and a whole lot more. And we also offer a performance engineering seminar where we teach you dozens of different data analysis methodologies to maximize the performance of the car you built. Besides that, these are the services that Optimum G offers. We offer vehicle dynamics consulting, where we could, for example, be helping you design the suspension of your passenger or race car, and many other services in terms of vehicle and tire testing, development, and simulation. We also offer performance engineering consulting, where you could have one of our performance engineers at the track with you, applying all of our methodologies. And we also offer simulation software in the areas of vehicle dynamics, kinematics design, and tire analysis. Thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions or comments whatsoever, please leave them in the comment section so that I can get back to you. And I'll see you in the next one.